Hello, everyone. Welcome. I want to introduce myself. My name is Marsha Mott, and I work at UF Health, and uh, we have a great webinar for you tonight. I want to kind of go over a few housekeeping kind of things before we get started. Uh, the first one is tonight that we're going to accept questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So if you have a question you want to submit to us or you need something clarified a little bit more, go ahead and type your question. You can type it at any time. Um, and then at the end of the um, webinar tonight, we're going to answer those questions and see if we can get uh, an answer for you to your question. We have a wonderful speaker tonight. Um, Dr. Jason Zaremski is our speaker tonight. He is the director of our throwing program at UF Health. Um, and when he gets his presentation up and gets started, um, we're going to go ahead and get going. But in the meanwhile, we wanted to know a little bit more about the audience. So I'm going to put up a, a quick, um, a little poll for you guys. And if you wouldn't mind taking just a second to let us know, like what sports you're interested in, what sports you play and things like that. And when we get the uh, answers, I'm going to share that with the audience here in a minute. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and let him get things going. And uh, then we'll share that poll in a second. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, by the way. Thanks, Marsha. Can uh, can you see me? Yep, I see you just fine. Awesome. So um, as Marsha just said, uh, I'm Jason Zaremski. Um, thank you for everyone who has joined us tonight. I know it's in the middle of a, a, a week. Uh, if you're down in Florida, baseball has started up, softball has started up. If you're up north, you're probably in between uh, kind of basketball season winding down and maybe uh, swim season as well. So um, you know, the goal really of the development of the throwing clinic is really to kind of spread the message about, you know, simple ways that we can either prevent injury or reduce the likelihood of, of injury. And tonight's goal is really kind of do a, an overview, focusing more on the adolescent athlete. Um, with that, I do want to make sure I thank Marsha, as well as Erica Griffith and Gabrielle Massari, who have probably been... Uh, uh, emailing folks like crazy, trying to get the word out using social media. So I, I definitely want to thank the three of you and, and UF Health um, for supporting this endeavor. Uh, Marshall, what you got on some of the answers yeah, so far? I'm guessing we got a lot of baseball players here tonight. Okay. So we got some softball, we got some lacrosse, um, a lot of baseball, which I certainly understand. Um, and one thing to note, um, we definitely have some ideas planned to make sure we incorporate more of our softball athletes and even some stuff with lacrosse down the road. So with that, I'm gonna get started. Um, and again, I do wanna thank everyone for joining us online tonight, uh, whether you're on the East Coast or in uh, another part of the country or world. Um, we, we had some indication there might be a lot of folks outside of the greater North Central Florida region. So thank you for spending your time with us tonight. So right. I know Marsha is adding this on right now, so I'll let you guys do uh, that while um, you're kind of uh, inputting where you're from. Um, you know, really, we're going to go over kind of three major things, kind of, kind of what is the evidence based on protection of the throwing athlete and really focused from the adolescent perspective. What is some new data um, that's come out recently? And I'll focus a little bit on weighted ball programs. I know that's a big hot topic for uh, improving velocity in, in a kind of a quick amount of time. And then uh, lastly, maybe some opportunities for advancement, prevention of injuries in the years to come. Then I'll end with a slide, though I think Marsha may put up a poll as well, of maybe some topics that folks that are on this call tonight would like to see in the future. So as expected, uh, you know, a significant proportion are in the greater Gainesville, Florida area. But outside of Gainesville, um, you know, we have a few more in the state of Florida, but actually we have the southeast the Northeast, the Midwest, uh, we even have a West Coast person and we have someone outside the United States. I have a feeling I know who that is because he texted me or emailed me. But th this kind of goes to show you that, you know, through the age of Zoom and webinar, um, we can really make a concerted effort to really help, uh, in this case, our student athletes. So with that, um, I always start this off when I'm seeing a younger athlete in clinic or if I'm doing a talk like this is, you know, if I'm talking to a parent, if I'm talking to a, an athlete going, what do you want? And in the case of baseball and softball, a lot of times it's, I want to throw harder, which we totally understand. If we're a parent, if we're an older brother or sister or grandparent, we want our athletes, our kids to be successful. If we're a coach, we certainly want to improve performance. And I think all of us want um, our athletes to stay healthy. And sometimes, for example, throwing harder and staying healthier are kind of directly in conflict with each other. So it makes it a little bit difficult. So then I ask, you know, when does the injury cycle start? And I usually ask this to some of our trainees. And I say, does it start 
when you're, if you're playing baseball at the youth level, maybe at that pre-high school, that kind of adolescent, middle school, sixth to eighth grade level, or is it high school? Is it college? And so a shout out to Emory University where I played baseball, or is it at the professional level? And quite honestly, it's really at the youth level and the pre-high school level. It doesn't mean you're going to suffer an injury that prevents you from competing or maybe causes you to miss time in your sport, but it may be the start of some overuse injuries because of something that may have been missed or not have been focused on. And we'll talk about that. So what are some common reasons for overuse injuries? This is um, probably a study that I quote a lot, but it's really kind of straightforward. And to give credit, this came out of the American Sports Medicine Institute in Birmingham, Alabama, and it's about 17 years old now. And what they looked at was adolescent baseball pitchers who pitched more than 100 innings in a 12-month period. And what they found with those uh, who pitched more than 100 innings in a year were three and a half times more likely to have an injury. If you played for multiple teams at the same time, your injury risk goes up. If you play more than eight months in a year, usually that's not an issue up north. I grew up in Chicago. I lived in Boston for many years. Um, that, that usually is not as much an issue, but down in Florida, as a lot of us know, in the southeast, in the west coast, Texas, Louisiana, that can certainly be an issue. Participating in showcases, that's a big one. And this was probably the most impressive stat I think I've ever seen in a study, is pitchers who continue to throw despite arm fatigue and who were adolescent were 36 times more likely to suffer an injury than those who did not. Now, the other thing that's interesting is this study came out in 2006, which means the data was collected probably in 2004, 2005, and yet injuries are continuing to go up. So we're missing something here. So what are some common reasons to be at risk? So number one, and I, and I saw a couple uh, patients this week that um, kind of fit the bill with this, is one, a growth spurt. Uh, for those of you who may be in the 40s, remember Jerry O'Connell, who's you know a, kind of a, a Hollywood actor, that he grew 12 inches in one year. So when you have a, a rapid growth spurt uh, during puberty, this can create extra sort of tightness and tension in your muscles and tendons, making our younger teens in particular more, more prone to injury. And then our growth plates and our bones are affected by these hormonal changes. So there's risk of stress fractures as well. In addition to that, combine that with in baseball and softball, especially, and I use the baseball uh, distances here, you're changing the size of field. Once you get uh, outside of the little league age, you're going from 40 to 46, that should say 50 to 54 feet to 60 feet, six inches. Your bases are going from 60 feet up to 90 feet. Distance in the outfield is going from 200 feet to when you get on a big, big field, it's going to eventually be around 400 feet. So all these things come into play. And unfortunately, adolescents who are having a growth spurt and changing the dimensions of what they're playing at are at risk just because of these factors alone, even if they follow everything else that we recommend. So, you know, a little background is, you know, why do we even care about this? Obviously, we probably care about baseball or maybe for those of you on the call um, tonight have a son or daughter playing sport and maybe they had an injury or they you want to prevent them from, from gaining an injury. This was a really nice study that was done a couple of years ago and, and they really looked at risk factors for elbow and shoulder injuries in adolescent baseball players. And what it found was that um, definite risk factors was your age, how tall you were playing for multiple teams at the same time, how fast you threw, pitching with arm fatigue, and pitches per game, particularly with shoulder injuries, that's your pitch count. Things that don't really seem to be significant risk factors, innings pitched. And we found that pitch counts are a much better marker of volume instead of innings, so that's something to mention. Showcase participation, number of games per year, again, because how many innings are you playing and then how much are you actually throwing within those games. Train days per week, per week, pitch type. If you're a pitcher, that's a whole uh, other uh, area that's pretty controversial that we can always talk, you know, down the road. But whether curveballs should be, you know, not in, uh, thrown when you are skeletally immature, and your range of motion in your shoulder, and then some factors that are kind of we're not quite sure. We think maybe there is something, but we can't really uh, show it. Is how much you weigh number of months pitching per year, number of innings pitching per year, if you're also a catcher, and then some other ranges of motion, something called glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. Basically, it's a range of motion measurement we use in overhead athletes. So, you know, there's lots of different risk factors, but if you notice on the left-hand side, especially the ones in yellow, 
Um, those are things that we can really, you know, as parents, as caregivers, as sports medicine professionals, as healthcare professionals, that we can really work on. And because of that, um, some colleagues uh, of mine, Giorgio Zepieri, who's a fantastic physical therapist, and Dr. Bray Tripp, who's a athletic trainer and runs uh, co-runs our doctoral athletic training program here at UF, we were asked and developed a model for injury causality in adolescent throwing athletes. And let me walk you through this. What this basically means is there's all these factors that you know put one at risk for injury. One is called intrinsic risk factors. So that's how old you are, how tall you are, your skeletal age. You're not going to be able to change that. So that's intrinsic to you. We also add in something that hadn't been put in the literature before. If you can see where my arrow is in the lower left-hand side, that's developmental risk factors. That's your strength, your range of motion, how fast are you throwing, what's your skill level, et cetera, et cetera. All of these factors predispose an adolescent throwing athlete to an injury. It doesn't mean you have an injury, just predispose you to that. Then our athletes get exposed to extrinsic risk factors. You're specialized in sports at a young age. You pitch too much. You play too many games per week. Your pitch type, which is controversial, maybe you play pitcher and catcher at the same time in the same game or same week. So that now takes you from the intrinsic risk factors to exposure, and now that athlete becomes susceptible as an adolescent throwing athlete, and then what happens? We provide them with an assigned event, which basically means they go pitch or they go throw, and that puts them at an increased risk of injury. That doesn't mean they're going to get an injury, but it just puts them at an increased risk for injury compared to someone who didn't maybe specialize in sports or throw too much. So one possible explanation, and this is we'll get into kind of the first area, are pitch counts. So we know that baseball players in particular accumulate unaccounted pitching volume during a warm-up and bullpen, but that activity is unaccounted for. So previously, this hasn't been examined, and, and this is a, a picture of our UF Sports Performance Center and doing a pitching analysis uh, on the first floor of our building. And you know what our colleagues were thinking in, at UF was like, how can we figure this out? Well, Right around that time, back in 2016, there was pitch count regulations that were implemented in the United States, and this came through the National Federation of State High School Associations, and basically what it showed is that high school baseball rules now require pitching restriction policy based on the number of pitches thrown in a game. Now, for those of you who may be interested in softball, there's some recommendations, but it's really not nearly as robust, and there is some data that's being worked on. Actually, one of my colleagues has a study hopefully coming out fairly soon. Uh, from the softball side, uh, looking at pitch counts as well. So what the National Federation says is that each state will be required to develop its own pitching restriction policy. And a lot of times what each state did is end up using some recommendations that came down from Major League Baseball and Little League Baseball. So when we actually studied this at UF, we wanted to find out how many pitches do pitchers actually throw? Well, what we did, and this is through the work of many interns, many researchers, um, and some other colleagues, we counted every single pitch thrown off a mound during a varsity high school baseball game played at 34 different high schools in North Central Florida in 2017. And we had, you know, three different types of uh, pitches. We had our bullpen pitches, our warm-up pitches, and our live game pitches. So we just termed this total game day pitches. We just add up all three. We're not reinventing the wheel. We're just trying to count up something that hasn't been counted before. And what we found is, you know, we recorded nearly 14,000 pitches uh, through 115 varsity high school starting pitcher outings. We did not count JV or in some schools had a, had a freshman team. We just did the varsity guys. And what we found was this. Coaches did a fantastic job really doing a doing following recommendations. If you look in the lower left or in the upper left hand side, live game pitches, the mean number of pitches was under 70 pitches. So I really applaud all the coaches. Um, you know, doing a great job of main, making sure their pitchers stayed under what would be the maximum, which would be 105 if you're 18 years old. However, if you actually add in the bullpen pitches and the warm-up pitches, the average number of pitches was 120. And for what it's worth, the average total innings pitched was only four innings. When you go back to the range, you're looking at every single pitcher out of the nearly 14,000 pitches, not one pitcher went over that 105 pitch mark. So again, I, I really do applaud all the coaches in the greater North Central Florida area. But if you actually look in the total number of pitches, again, because no one's counting those, there was the high mark of 174. And it, we don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but 12% of all pitchers threw more than 150 pitches. And by the way, not one pitcher threw more than seven innings. 
So this basically showed us there's about 40, 42% of pitches that are unaccounted for. So the next thing we need to figure out is this thing called workload. Now, this has become a little bit of a loaded term. The probably the international expert in this, uh, his name is right here, is uh, Tim Gabbett. Uh, Dr. Gabbett is all of Australia. He has uh, probably got more than 500 publications, but he is really the workload expert. And to try to make it as simple as possible, we know there's an acute uh, workload and there's a chronic workload. Acute means what you're doing for one to seven days of work. So that means your fatigue state of the athlete. What did you do yesterday? What did you do this week? Chronic workload is more of the fitness or the readiness of the athlete over a four week or a one month period. So you're averaging that. And what you want to do is ideally stay in this green area. So you want to have your acute to chronic workload ratio somewhere around one, maybe one and a quarter, one and a third. But if you get up into the area like, say, two, that's when you have an increased risk of injury. Again, not going to suffer an injury, but your risk goes up. So what does that mean in real numbers? Let's say you have a baseball pitcher who is a, is a closer, and he typically will throw, let's say, 20 pitches a game, comes in for seventh inning, closes things out. Let's say there's been a couple of rainouts. Uh, someone else has got to take the SATs. So suddenly he needs to throw, he needs to start on a Saturday after closing on Thursday and he throws a complete game. So he went from throwing 20 pitches to hundred pitches, but he's not used to throwing that. So his workload was 5.0 for that week because he went up a five-fold increase. So again, this is that sort of thing that's really being implemented, the collegiate level, the professional levels are looking at this. Some high schools are doing this. The challenge is always the adolescents because there's less resources available. But what we know is missing from this is we're not combining our total pitch volume with our intensity or our velocity. We need to improve our measures of workload. So some folks, um, especially some folks on this call tonight may be aware, they'll say, oh, well, you know, my son or my daughter threw 50 pitches. So that was his or her workload. Pitch count is not workload. Pitch count is part of the workload. So we have to consider how hard are you throwing? Is it your max effort? Is it 105 degrees outside in Florida in July? Is it 27 degrees at your first game of the year in Minneapolis? All these things come into play. So we also know from some data, and again, this is uh, from some of our Australian colleagues that there's really poor measures of how to measure workload and throwing in, do in throwing dominant sports. So we have to combine not only our volume, that's the pitch count, but our intensity or effort, that's your velocity. And then you start to end other stuff like your kinetic chain, your biomechanics. Is someone pitching correctly, efficiently, efficiently, I should say, or are their mechanics all off? So what we are trying to determine at UF, and this is another study we have going on right now, is we really want to find out, does workload correlate to total game day pitch count and correlate to injuries. And if we can show this, and data should be coming out probably in the next 12 months or so, we have one more year to go in our study. If we can show this, we now can truly show that increased pitch counts do have an association with workload, which can lead to injury or increased risk of injury. So we really have to start monitoring that. And you know, the question is, how do we do that? Do we have to build up our athletes more so in the off season, or do we have to manage their workload more in season? So with that said, what are some common throwing injuries? I'm not going to go through every single injury because I think every single person will log off, but some common stuff, and some of you on the call are patients of mine or parents of patients of mine, and some of you have these injuries. So, you know, little league elbow or some tendonitis that usually happens on the inside part or the pinky part of your elbow. Sometimes when you start to throw harder, you can start to go from having a little inflammation or tendonitis to actually avulse or take off a little piece of bone. You can have something called osteochondritis desiccans, which is a fancy way of saying where the bone meets the cartilage and can kind of come off. We call it almost like a loose body if it comes off. Stress fractures. These aren't very common injuries. I've probably seen somewhere around 12 to 14 in the kind of the, the lower part of the upper arm. So just above the elbow. But if the elbow seems fine and someone is hurting kind of just below the bicep and they're throwing a lot of pitches and they're just not getting better, that's something where you should start to think about, hmm, we have to make sure there's not a stress fracture. I think everyone has heard about the Tommy John injuries. That's the UCL or the ulnar collateral ligament injuries. Some folks can have nerve impingements. Their nerve get pinched around the elbow, occasionally in the shoulder, but more so in the elbow. Uh, these things called flexor 
pronator mass injuries. That's basically the, if you can see in my forearm here, I'm not sure if you can or not, but that's kind of that forearm muscle belly on the palm side of your forearm. It's really important to actually make sure that muscle is really strong or muscles, I should say, are really strong because that mu those, you know, it's about four muscles offloads the load that the UCL or the Tommy John ligament picks up. So if your flexor forearm muscle is weak or you have a small injury, the risk of sustaining a UCL injury actually goes up. In the shoulder, we can go in a lot of depth, but just to keep it simple, you can have injury to your rotator cuff, although that is less common the younger you are. You can have something called lily shoulder, which essentially is a stress fracture where the growth plate is. You can injure what's called your shoulder labrum, which is the cartilage deep in the shoulder that kind of deepens the socket. One of my surgical colleagues likes to say as the golf ball sits on the T, that T is where the, the labrum is. And it's really the biceps tendon up at the top of the shoulder. So those are four common areas. And I will say this for, for our windmill pitchers, our softball pitchers, the long head of the biceps tendon, just the way that you pitch, that is something that I see more so in our windmill pitchers than our baseball pitchers is some biceps tendonitis. But the question ultimately is, why are we getting these injuries? Why? I sustained some of these injuries. I had a partial UCL injury when I was a junior in college. I actually have a partial rotator cuff injury that I sustained when I was a senior in college. Why are these injuries occurring if we're trying to do all this stuff? Well, you know, this has become such a hot topic that there's actually a book written about this. Um, as some of you may have read this, some of you may be aware of this. It's a nice book by Jeff Passan, who I think writes for ESPN now. But, you know, the UCL, because it takes so long to rehab from this, and there's a lot of money invested at the professional level, you know, as he writes, it's it's the billion dollar industry. It's it's probably the second most famous ligament after the ACL. And when folks on ESPN and Fox Sports uh, you know, kind of outside of the medical world are aware of these injuries, you know that this has kind of entered the, the general, general public's, you know, atmosphere. And it also seems like everyone comes in the clinic, if their thrower and their elbow hurts, oh my God, am I having Tommy John surgery? No, not everyone injures their UCL, not everyone's getting Tommy John surgery. Folks seem to think that is, but I think part of that is because of the publicized nature of when a major league baseball pitcher or you heard about the San Francisco 49ers quarterback when they have that injury they know they're going to be out for a, a long period of time sometimes a year sometimes a little less sometimes a little more so what are some ways that folks have been trying to maybe improve their performance so I'm going to talk about weighted ball programs uh, for a couple slides I am going to present a couple of the evidence a few of the evidence-based um publications also. So hopefully it won't be too boring, but it's actually pretty interesting. What I usually do, and I think more and more sports medicine doctors are doing this now with weighted ball velocity programs is if these programs work, but we know they lead to an increase in injury, how do we advise our patients, our athletes, our parents, our coaches, our sport performance team members? If I say, you know, John is 16 years old, but if he does this program, he's going to take his fastball from 88 to 93, and he's going to go from possibly getting a college scholarship to possibly being drafted in the top five rounds, but there's going to be a 25% risk you're going to injure yourself. Would you take that risk? What I say is I present all the data to the athlete and to the parents, and I say, you know, ultimately you have to make a decision. What I strongly recommend against is not doing these programs if someone has open growth plates because you run the risk of injuring the bone more so with open growth plates. So we'll start with these two questions. The first is, do these programs actually work? What does the data show? And do these programs in pitchers actually lead to injury or put you at a greater injury risk? So we do know one thing, and this has been data that's been over and over and over again. I just put a couple uh, high highlights up there. We know that the harder one throws, the more likely you are to injure your UCL. This has been shown over and over again. The other thing that's very interesting is I took this from Mike Reinhold's website. Um, if you look from 2007 to 2014, the average uh, velocity went up from about 91 and a half miles an hour to about 92 and a half miles an hour. Now you may say one mile per hour, that's not that much. Well, if you think about it, that was 2014. When was the last time you saw a major league baseball closer not throw under 95 miles per hour? 
there used to be a kind of the adage that except for Rawlis Chapman, no one threw over 100 miles per hour. And now you can look up the data. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pitches and numerous pitchers that are thrown over 100 every single day in the major leagues and in the minor leagues. Um, I will tell you at the highest of levels for Division One baseball, you have pitching staffs that are almost every collegiate pitcher, even freshmen, are throwing over 90 miles per hour. So this is something that, while it's great that pitchers are throwing harder, you also have to be aware of the injury risk that comes along with it. So there are these two big, what are called systematic reviews. Uh, for those of you who don't know, systematic reviews are papers that look at, at kind of all of the data that have been done on a specific topic. So prior to 2020, there were only two reviews published in the prior 20 years on ball velocity when you're using weighted balls. And absolutely, every single study showed that if you did a weighted ball velocity program, ball velocity increased in a short amount of time, whether it was six weeks or eight weeks or 10 weeks. However, they didn't really know the long-term safety effects using this train modality. We also know that you know just throwing harder when you're younger can actually cause an increase in pain. So this is a really nice study done by our Japanese colleagues that we're looking at elementary school players. So the average age was around 11, 12 years old. The range was around nine to 12. And after using um, this pitch velocity program, what they found was there was an increase in pitch velocity of about six miles per hour uh, or 10 kilometers per hour for those of you that are outside the US right now. But with that increase in velocity, there was an increase in what's called the medial epicondyle or the inside part of your elbow where that UCL is and pain increased threefold. So again, it's something to be aware of. We looked at some more data. Uh, this again came out of the American Sports Medicine Institute. This was a lab setting. And what they did is they did high school players, collegiate baseball pitchers. They did different trials with different weighted baseballs. And they went from, uh, so uh, five ounces is, is a normal ball. So four ounces was underweight. Six was just overweight. Seven is a little heavier. And then obviously these really heavy balls, 14, 32 ounces. And what they showed is what's called the kinematics and kinetics. So basically the forces as well as the motion were similar using underweight baseballs and these standard baseballs, but actually all the forces, the torques, the velocity, everything went down when they used the really heavy balls. So that's kind of confusing. If you're throwing with less force, throwing with less angular velocity, why are you having an increased risk of injury? So this was then another really great study that I've cited before. This came out of the Rothman Institute in New York. They did the same thing, but they used light baseballs. This is the first one of these studies I've ever seen done. And they compared lighter baseballs to standard baseballs. And what they found was fastball velocity actually increased about five miles an hour, but not one player got hurt using lighter baseballs as opposed to the heavier baseballs. So finally, this is kind of the study that seemed to make the news a lot. Um, kind of went outside of the medical journals and the sports medicine athletic training journals, kind of made it into sort of the ESPN world. And this was 38 healthy baseball pitchers that are high school age. And they basically had a six-week program in two groups, one using, you know, standard balls, one using, you know, overweight balls as well. What they found is that there was about a two mile an hour increase in the weighted ball group, just like every other study. It also showed that there was an increase in shoulder external range of motion. So that's kind of turning your arm backwards with an L. And there's an increase in force, 12.2 newtons, or basically there's just think of it as force with external rotation strength in the control group. The problem became is that there were no injuries in the control group, but the weighted ball group, there was four injuries or 24% of the athletes. Two were stress fractures. One partially tore his Tommy John ligament. One completely tore it. So th that, that's kind of the risk that I was talking about. So the other thing to be aware of, the study that I just presented, these were healthy pitchers without a prior injury to their shoulder or elbow. You can imagine if you have someone maybe has a prior injury with a shoulder or elbow uh, issue in the past, does that put them at even greater risk? So I know this is kind of getting confusing, kind of get deep in the weeds, but what we know is this. These weighted ball programs, they are absolutely effective at enhancing or increasing pitch velocity. But kind of the angular velocity, so when instead of going in a straight line, kind of in a rotational manner, these angular velocities and the stressors on the elbow weren't really different, you know, after the weighted ball program. So we know that these programs don't lead to greater arm strength or arm speed. 
So how the heck is pitch velocity actually being increased? What we think is going on is that shoulder range of motion, particularly external range of motion, increases the pitch velocity. And because of that, the forces about the shoulder and the elbow increase. We also know that nearly 80% of pitching injuries occur in athletes with greater amounts of shoulder rotational motion. So this is what we think is happening here. It's that there's an acute ramp up in range of motion acutely. So the question goes back to, is this actually safe to do? Again, there is an inherent risk if you use weighted ball programs, particularly if you have open growth plates. So if you have a 12, 13, 14 year old is very different than say a 18 or 19 year old athlete. So we're pointing it together. Essentially the use of these overweighted balls leads to an increase in shoulder external range of motion. Very simple. We get it. That leads to increased pitch velocity. Athletes happy, coaches happy, parents are probably happy as well. The problem is there's an increase in shoulder and elbow forces. So unfortunately, this leads to an increased injury risk. So that's something to certainly be, or what, be aware of if you are someone on the call tonight that is using this program or uh, interested in potentially starting a weighted ball program in the off season. So what's the verdict? Yes, these programs work. It likely does increase the risk of injury compared to controls. And I would be very concerned if someone's in kind of their earlier high school years or younger, if they're using these programs. I personally, I present this information to everyone involved, the patients, the athletes, the parents, and let them choose as long as they know the risk and they know all the information. It's something to be aware of because you have this risk reward. You know, I don't want to prevent someone from getting the opportunity to get a college scholarship, make the high school team, possibly get drafted, be able to play on a team with their friends. But they do have to understand that there is some risk that comes along with this particular method to increase your throwing velocity. So what are the recommendations? Number one, if anyone is going to start or use these programs, please do it under the supervision of experts, whether that is a pitching coach who knows what he or she is doing, whether it's a sports performance individual who is a strength and conditioning coach, but there really should be someone who knows what they're doing, have used these programs before. Again, caution should be used in kind of our adolescent or younger athletes as well. And But really, these programs should not be used in isolation. They should be used as one component of an overall program to train the entire body. And that's not something we're going to talk a ton about tonight, but it, to do something called a connect chain training program, you know, whether it's strengthening your gluteal muscles or your butt, whether it's your hamstring flexibility, whether it's doing squats, whether it's, you know, your kinetics where with the overhead to underhand motion, whether it's doing some different proprioceptive training, all that should be used in conjunction. And if you use the weighted ball velocity program, it should be used as one component. It shouldn't be the major component. And then some basic prevention principles. Number one is, you know, we should follow our rest guidelines. But number two is preseason throwing programs. I put up here, this comes from Major League Baseball. Um, there are these things called, there's this site called MLB Pitch Smart, and it's a great site. And they put up uh, recommendations for pitch count limits and required rest recommendations. Now, their recommendations have actually been adopted by many states, Florida included, as restrictions at the high school level. So, for example, if you are an 18-year-old senior and you go out and throw 103 pitches, like I showed in that study earlier, that's great. But you are now resting for four consecutive days from pitching on the mound. So it's something that I think is important to be aware of. And again, if for parents on the call, for anyone else who's not aware of this, you just go to MLB.com or you can just Google MLB Pitch Smart. So the challenge has been, um, you know, getting some of our athletes to ask, Doc, what throwing program, what the heck are you talking about? You know, down in Florida is very different than up north. I said I grew up in Chicago. Up north, your preseason for high school softball and baseball is typically going to be in February and March. And then your season is usually March or April until just after Memorial Day. If you're in the South, your high school preseason is before Christmas. Usually it starts around Thanksgiving unless you're playing another sport. Um, I can tell you that our teams in the county where I am right now, they started games this week and they started practice on January 28th this year. So their preseason, if they're getting their arms ready to go, starts before winter break. 
Their season starts in February, as I mentioned, and the state playoffs start the first week of May. So unless you get to the state championship, which I think goes to about Memorial Day or so, your season is probably going to end around the first week in May. Now, for the if you're up north, once you get into travel ball or when your high school season ends, that's usually around Memorial Day until Labor Day. That's a pretty standard schedule. Sometimes you go a little bit longer. In the south, travel ball is May until when does high school season start? You know, there's summer ball, there's fall ball, there's winter ball. And then, uh, you know, folks usually take the two weeks off around Christmas and New Year's and then high school baseball starts up again. You know, in the up north, prime training, if you're not playing in another sport, is usually October to January. And in the south, it's literally going, what are you talking about training for baseball? I just keep playing all year round. So that's sort of the challenge that um, I had to get used to when I came down to Florida um, from, you know, doing all my training up north and growing up up north. It's fantastic. Um, and those of you on the call from Florida or in the southeast know it is awesome to have the warm weather. I mean, it was 75 today. I went for a jog. So I apologize for those of you up north on right now. But on the flip side, if if an athlete wants to play in a throwing sport, baseball, softball, we can consider tennis, lacrosse, or maybe your swimmer, you got to take time for yourself to prepare for your season. Because if not, you're going to develop an overuse injury. So um, some of you uh, that I've seen in clinic actually uh, recently have asked about different types of throwing programs, and there's various programs out there. Some are return to throw, some are return to pitch, uh, some are just preseason training programs uh, to get your arm ready for the season. This is an example of a training program that you can start to use at the 13-year-old age level, so kind of that middle school and use up until you know middle of high school or so. And again, what's really important is you start at whatever you start at, usually you go low and slow. And for example, here, phase one, start at 30 feet. And you're going to maybe do 20 throws at 30 feet, rest a minute or two, warm up again, do it again. And you do that. And then you might have a day or two in between what rest. The other thing I don't, don't have up here because I didn't want to kind of muddy the slide is kind of your effort. And this is very subjective. There's studies done that when an athlete says, oh, I'm always throwing 50% of my max effort, eh, it's probably closer to 75 to 85% actually. So a lot of times when someone is coming off of an injury, whether they've had surgery or not, we want your effort to not be a lot. We want you to do maybe 25 to 50% subjective effort so that you slowly build yourself up. Again, if we go back to workload, we talk about effort. We talk about volume as two of the main areas to, to make up the workload. So again, not anything you need to memorize, but just understand the importance of a progressive return to throw program, whether it's return to the season or return after an injury. What about some post-pitching recovery suggestions? So this could be after an outing or this could be after an injury. And this really hasn't changed um, in the last 10 or 15 years. Develop a consistent routine. You should do some form of a cool down activity. Some folks like to run poles. Some people like to just ice. Whatever it is, have a cool down activity. But the key is once you're cooling down, don't return to throw. You should definitely work on a static flexibility program. That means you're stretching without bouncing your arm a lot. You might want to review your pitching performance. Again, get in the habit of maybe what did you do well? What didn't you do? That helps with the mental side of things as well. Sometimes, you know, especially if we're fortunate enough to have uh, an athlete at a high school, let's say, where there's an athletic trainer present, he or she may ask going, hey, how are you feeling? And, you know, this thing called a visual analog scale uh, will sometimes say from on a scale of zero to 10, what's your pain level? And the way I would say it is zero is no pain at all. 10 out of 10 is, you know, we need to cut my arm off or it's the worst pain ever I've had. So an athletic trainer may ask that or if there's a physical therapist or a team physician covering the game. Ice be for 12 to 15 minutes. I know there's some different debates up there about some folks may not want to icy more. Some will do five or 10 minutes. Some may do longer, but on average, this is sort of routine. And then you're done for the day. If you're done pitching, you're not going back into pitch. And I would also venture catch as well. If you are going from pitcher to catcher, and I don't necessarily advise that, I would not recommend, you know, cooling your arm down until after the game or once you get taken out. If there's a double header, you can certainly play the infield afterwards, but you've got to make sure you warm your body up. But I would not, you know, pitch one inning in game one and then go back and pitch in the second game. I realize occasionally I may say if it's the state playoffs, if it's the state championship, in that case, maybe we would let that go because it's the end of the season. But in general, once you're done pitching, you're done pitching. 
And then obviously it's really important to work on your balance, your strength, your pliability and coordination between starts. Um, for those of, again, those of us that are fortunate to work with athletic trainers and physical therapists um, that are at high schools, um, they do a fantastic job. And, you know, if you do have an AT or a PT at your school, a lot of times it's going to be an AT, please pick their brains. They are there to help protect our student athletes. They are the first line. I, I think, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, we became more aware of it. Uh, for those of you not in sports medicine after uh, the DeMar Hamlin incident, and thank God that there was a ton of medical personnel, including the athletic trainers doing CPR on the field. Um, that's usually not needed in baseball and softball and spring sports in general. Um, but it is something where having an athletic trainer can really be helpful to reduce the likelihood of injury or more severity of injury. What are some relative rest guidelines? And I put relative in quotes because when I say rest, I do not mean you're going home and playing, you know, PS5 or whatever it is. It's we want to watch and respond to signs of fatigue while you're pitching or while you're working out. We prefer no overhead throwing for at least two to three months a year, though the official recommendation is four months a year. No competitive baseball pitching for four months a year, as I just mentioned. We do want to limit our pitch counts, adhere to days of rest as recommended or enacted by your state high school athletic association. Um, or if you're playing at a tournament, some tournaments have them, some are a little more lax with it. I definitely recommend and agree with MLB Pitch Smart and USA Baseball on avoiding pitching on multiple teams and showcases. Definitely have good throwing mechanics, which is something that certainly can be worked on if you have access to a biomechanist, a really strong pitching coach. And please, please enforce, you know, preseason throwing program, which challenging, at least down in the Southeast right now, the season started. So this is something we have to remember for next November. For those of you who are up North, particularly very, very up North, um, you might be doing this right now, or you still have another month or so until you go into the gym and, and start uh, practice. So what are some preventive programs at a young age? This is just one program, again, came from our Jap Japanese colleagues I wanted to show that um, just simple programs can be really helpful. This was an intervention program uh, for ages eight to 11. And they took you know more than 300 uh, young uh, folks and they basically had two groups. One group didn't do anything. And another group had the intervention. They did some nine, they did nine strengthening and stretching exercises one or more times per week. That's all they did. And if you look at the rate of medial elbow injury, which is that inside part of your elbow again, the intervention group or the group that did the strength and stretching had half the number of injuries as the other group. Now, again, these are kids that are eight to 11 years old that haven't gone through puberty or not thrown super hard yet. So you can imagine having a program like this as one starts to go through puberty and starts to generate the sort of forces and torques where you can cause some significant injury to your elbow and your shoulder and other parts of your body. Another thing is learning biomechanics at a young age. Uh, this was an uh, unbelievable study led by the team in Birmingham. Uh, they did a seven-year study. Um, for those of you who do research, know how challenging this is. But you know, they did a seven-year study, and what they found essentially was that, oops, is that when you're younger, so between the age of nine to thirteen, the motion, the kinematics, were the most significant. But when you got to the ages of about 13 or 13 to 15, the kinetics. So when you start including the forces that start to increase. So what does that mean? The motion was more significant when you're younger and the forces when you get a little bit older, that meant that if you did not teach good mechanics before you go through puberty or before you get to high school, you're going to be throwing with poor motion. And then when you start to develop more power, because you're going through puberty, the potential for risk of injuring these structures in the shoulder and elbow and other parts of your body start to increase because you're throwing really hard now with really poor motion. This was something that um, I put together. Uh, I was asked to put together. It got published um, last year. This is, and I'm more than happy to send it to folks, but this is a what's called an infographic. And it's basically a conglomeration of all the data that's out there on a particular topic. This happens to be of UCL injuries. And this kind of shows in very simple terms and kind of pictorial form, you know, how do we make a diagnosis? Where are the sports where this is going to affect the most? And obviously baseball, softball, and then javelin are the, the three top sports with baseball far and away number one. How do we diagnose this? 
type of imaging modalities that we use. And we usually use MRI or, or, or an ultrasound. Um, what are the factors for treatment if you don't need surgery? Well, well, you know, the location of the injury, do we do physical therapy? Do we do these things called orthobiologics? So something like platelet-rich plasma or stem cells, which can be a whole talk unto itself. So this is something that is, is always nice to kind of refer back to. I'm more than happy to send to folks. If you send Marsha uh, a message, she'll refer, they'll, she'll, you'll, yeah, she'll send it on to me. Um, though I have my email up at the end that you can always email me directly. So, you know, what should we do ultimately? If there's a take home, what should we do? Well, from a workload perspective, there should be a slow buildup. You can't go, you know, if you're, I always say, if you're going to run the Boston Marathon, you got trained for the Boston Marathon. You don't show up and just run 26 miles. You need to have enough rest between starts if you're a pitcher. Don't play pitcher and catcher at the same time. I know in some exceptions, uh, state playoffs, uh, may occur in other instances, but we know from lots of data, uh, I think there was actually a study done by uh, Ellen Shanley, I believe, and I'm not sure if Gretchen Oliver as well, found that when you uh, looked at softball players who did pitcher and catcher at the same time, the risk of injury in the throwing arm went up two to threefold. And please, please do a throwing program. If you're in Florida, do start in December. If you're up north, you can start in January or February. When you're training, it's not just the arm. You got to train your hips. You got to train your hamstrings. You got to train your gluteal muscles your, or your buttocks, basically. Um, I like to ask this a lot is what's the most common injury in baseball? It is not a Tommy John injury. It is not a rotator cuff injury. The most common injury in baseball is actually a hamstring strain. It doesn't get a lot of notoriety because most of the time folks get better after a couple of weeks. So you really got to make sure you're training your lower body. Cross training, not cross fit, but cross training is the key. Working on your entire body from head to toe is really important. Obviously, you're going to work on your rotator cuff and your flexor forearm strength, uh, as I mentioned before, and learn correct pitch mechanics at an early age. Now, some people may have more resources or access to things than others do. We all understand that. But even today with smartphones, iPhones, Androids, you can take slow-mo on your picture. Uh, on, when you're taking a picture, you can put in slow-mo motion. And you can just look at stuff in two dimensions. Um, there's a colleague of mine, um, Dr. Chris, who's up in uh, Rhode Island, who's doing some great studies on this stuff uh, as well. So that's one way to do this, uh, particularly if you don't have a lot of resources. The biggest thing, though, is prepare. You got to prepare for your season, prepare for baseball, prepare for softball, prepare for running a marathon, whatever it is. Don't just show up or you know, a week before going, uh-oh, it's time to get ready. That's not how it works. Um, I'm probably speaking to the choir for those of you that are on right now, but prepare for your season. So what should we not do? Don't pitch or throw in pain. Don't show up without preparing to play. And, and I kind of have developed this, um, I like saying there's a three-pronged approach. You know, We have our fatigue thresholds, our pitch counts, our workloads, our velocity, that's all in, in one prong. We have our connect chain train and our program analysis. That's a whole other prong. And that's a whole other set of talks. And then we've got the biomechanics evaluation and monitoring sort of, you know, you're doing everything right, but if your motion is not great, maybe we need to work on that. So it all kind of fits together. Um, my email is at the top. I'm always happy to receive an email from someone asking some questions about the throwing clinic. Um, this is our website as well. Um, you know, it's just a, you know, a passion of mine. Like I said, I suffered a, a partial tear of my Tommy John ligament when I was a junior in college and having a really good season. And it kind of set me back. So once I figured out I wasn't going to be playing professional baseball, um, really my goal was to get into sports medicine and see if I can help out throwing athletes. It was honestly one of the main reasons I became a doctor. I want to do sports medicine. And I'm really passionate about, you know, throwing sports. So um, hopefully this was helpful. I put this up, but Marsha, if you wanted to throw up, I think you you made a poll. For those of you that are, that are on right now, if there are some topics that you would like to see in the future, whether it is through a webinar format or in person, by all means, please vote. Uh, I have spoken on a lot of these and other some other ones we, we continue to evolve as the data comes out. Uh, and whether it's with folks at UF and the UF Throwing Clinic, including myself and colleagues around the country, um, you know, I think it's really important. And honestly, I'm here for everyone that's that's on the call, whatever you might be interested in learning about 
or learning more about, or if there's something controversial, why can't my kid throw a curveball at the age of 12? We can show the data, we can talk about it and see what we think. I think it's great to have a, a really nice conversation and discord and, and show the evidence to everybody. And, and then hopefully this, you know, can get kids being, you know, performing better while at the same time reducing the likelihood of injury. Um, with that, I am going to stop my share. And then Marsha, I think you've been monitoring the Q and A. Um, yeah. So I'll let you tell me what's going yeah. on if folks have questions. Okay. I'm going to share the results of that survey in just a minute uh, as well. Yeah. I'll let a few more people take it. So uh, one of the questions we have is my son is nine years old and pitching up a level on a 10 U team. What are the best ways to massage his arm? So it's a good question. Um, it's not so much the massaging of the arm. Um, massaging feels good in general. It brings blood flow to certain areas. But what I would say is what is your son doing to prepare for pitching, if that's what he's doing, um, number one. And when he's done pitching, what is he doing in between his starts or in between practices? Massage is nice. It feels good. But he's going to get kind of more bang for the buck with doing other things as well, whether it's doing tubing exercises for his, his rotator cuff, working on kind of grabbing the, those of you, I remember, I think it was the Rocky thing, but where you're grabbing the grip and kind of working on your forearm muscle right after he's done pitching, maybe he runs for five minutes. So I think that is probably the best way. I don't think there's any great or better way to massage an arm um, and I'm not a masseuse, so I don't want to pretend that I am, but I think it's the other stuff that will, will benefit him in the long run. Okay. Thank you. Let me just uh, share those results of what people were interested in. So, so you can kind of see, cause people out there might be curious what everybody else is interested so, in. So kind of the year round playing early sports specialization, that's a huge uh, thing, especially when you're in a warm weather state. Um, you know, and then uh, probably the next couple were uh, nutrition. Nutrition is a big thing. And, in our uh, vice chair of research, uh, Dr. Heather Vincent ha is an expert in an area of nutrition. So I think that's something we certainly can talk about in the future. Maybe I, we can even invite her on. Um, differences between baseball and softball pitching, that would be fantastic to do. Um, you know, I know that baseball gets a lot of uh, data put out, but I'm really trying to make an effort to make sure that um, there is more information out there for our softball players as well. Um, there's some great data that comes out throughout the United States. Uh, probably Gretchen Oliver is the expert. Uh, she's at Auburn um, that puts out this uh, softball data. I think it's every <laughs> couple of weeks. So I think that's something we definitely can do uh, the next time we have uh, a webinar or if we do something in person, if we're fortunate to do it in person at a field on like a Saturday morning or something. Okay. What other Thanks. questions you got? Uh, okay, someone says, is there any utilization for stretching or even osteopathic manipulative medicine as a form of cooling down? That is a very interesting question. What I can tell you with regards to stretching, what the data has shown is you get more benefit from stretching after you do an activity, whether it's running, whether it's throwing, whatever it is, you get less benefit before you work out. So what we usually recommend is, you know, do a five minute jog, do some pulls, do what your coach tells you to do, do some gentle stretching of your forearm and your shoulder, but it's more important to do the stretching on the back end. And that's where you're going to improve that flexibility, improve that pliability as well. All right. Um, we got another question. Do the studies quantify or qualify pitching through fatigue? They kind of so say there, there is some data out there on that. And the, the challenge is trying to determine how do you quantify fatigue? Um, some folks use um, uh, the Borg scale. There, there's something called the Borg scale. It's not a Star Trek thing. Uh, it's actually a thing that, mm -hmm. that we use and it's rated from six to 20 of how hard something is. Some people use heart rate. So what is your resting heart rate? Let's say you rest between 60 and 80. And you're someone that's cool under pressure and you don't go above hundred and you're pitching. And then you have your counterpart, maybe the other, the opposing starting pitcher is very anxious, gets all worked up and their heart rate's going 140. Well, 
if your heart rate's going that fast, you're going to fatigue quicker because you just can't maintain that sort of endurance. Um, I don't care who you are, uh, unless you're, you know, a professional athlete. So there are ways to quantify fatigue. Just no one agrees on how to quantify it, if I can answer it that way. But heart rate is one way that folks have looked at it. Another way to see just how good in shape you are is using something called a VO2 max, which is more a, a exercise physiological uh, term and, and number to use, but you're usually not measuring that on a baseball or softball field. Okay. Yep. Uh, here's another question. So someone referenced a study that you, you talked about, and I know it was early on the slides, and they said, this is incredible. Is there any insight into factors such as playoff games versus regular season games or preseason versus scrimmages. You're talking, I'm assuming they're referring to pitch counts, or is it not? I, on there? I'm assuming. If the the person who wrote the question, if it was in regards to pitch counts, that's a really good question. The challenge becomes there are so few playoff games. Um, we could get that data, but there the numbers would be so small. It would take five or ten years to see if it's even um, reproducible data. So I would suspect that particularly at the high school level, your number one or number two pitcher or your number one pitcher and your number one closer are probably throwing more pitches than in the regular season. Um, but that's just a guess. But I'm not aware that there's data on just playoff games. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Can you discuss, discuss the pitch velocity standard deviation and how being at a higher velocity may necessitate a lower workload? So it's interesting. So if you're throwing harder, that means you've got more stress, you've got more um, angular velocity going across your different body parts, your shoulder, your elbow. Um, but if you've noticed, and I and the, and it, for me at the Major League Baseball level and, and grew up in Chicago, it, it kind of goes back to the 2016 World Series. That was the first time, and I think it was Terry Francona with the Indians, that was the first time we started seeing pitchers only go four or five innings, and then relievers are going two and three innings. So the game is being broken down into chunks as opposed to traditionally, unless the pitcher gets lit up, pitchers are going to go six, seven innings or longer. That was also kind of the time when velocities really started going up higher. And I think Andrew Miller, who was actually a Buholtz graduate, uh, for those of you down here, was uh, the Indians. I think he was the Indians closer at the time. And then Aralis Chapman was with the Cubs. If you remember, Chapman was just being put back out there um, over and over again, where uh, I remember in, I think it was the last game or the second last game, they were saying how his velocity was down so much. He was throwing 97 miles an hour, but he had been hitting 103. So. I, you know, it's, it's interesting, the harder you throw, it's tough to maintain that endurance, because of so much force and velocity, which I suspect is why the number of pitches is going down per pitcher, at least at the professional level, that would be a great study, I don't have access to data if MLB has that, but I think that would be great to look at. What's really challenging is you have to look back at all the data from a couple of years ago, and then you have to see if it's accurate or not. But I would suspect, and I know this data is out there, and there's some folks on the call will probably agree with me. If you look at the average length of a start at the Major League Baseball level in the last year or two, it is at least an inning or two less than what it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Okay. Well, thank you. Sure. Uh, the next one, what is the best way to handle high school athletes coming straight into baseball from another sports season like basketball um, that haven't had time to do a proper throwing program? That is a fantastic question. That's something that is a real challenge, particularly down, down in Florida uh, with the way the seasons are set up. Um, you know, I'm not a coach. I don't pretend to be a coach. The coaches know more than me about strategy and things of, of that nature. But I would say making a plan. If you've got, let's, let's use one, you know, some of the schools down here, a basketball player that's literally finishing basketball on a Friday or Saturday and baseball starts on Monday and wow. they've had time to get their arms ready. Their art, their hands aren't raw from hitting. I think the coach almost has to treat that athlete a little bit with kid gloves with regards to throwing and swinging, not so much with conditioning. You can run them until the cows come home if you want, but you got to build that arm up slowly and I think that's something that is a challenge sometimes, because if you have a basketball player or a swimmer 
and then they go right into baseball, they, they're not going to be doing the same thing that the athletes who've been working their arm for the last six weeks. So I think part of this is just good communication between the team physician, the athletic trainer, the player, the parent or caregiver with the head coach or with the manager. And I, and I think a lot of the time, I think the managers do a, and the coaches do a fantastic job with this. It's just making sure maybe there's a plan in place, maybe almost develop a plan in January or February going, how are we going to work, you know, Janie in with softball season starting and she hasn't really gotten her arm ready because she's finishing up, you know, in Florida soccer is a winter sport, finishing up soccer as an example. So I think that's really important, the communication and then almost developing a plan for the month of February if, if you're down here and, you know, March or April if you're up north. Okay. This is a, a pretty similar question, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it because it's slightly different. And I have to confess, I'm not a sports person. So, uh, but I had kids who played sports. So that counts a little. Um, for a player transitioning from um, U11 to U13 travel baseball and going into like high school and summer ball and things like that, when the volume of games, innings, and pitching increases, is there a good way to help prepare for that volume increase? Yeah, I mean, the best way to prepare for what you know is coming is to is to almost do that. So if you know that you are going to be transitioning, let's say, to a longer distance mount, or you know that your season's going to increase from eight weeks at a younger level to now 12 to 16 weeks, then I would suggest you start to prepare earlier. So if normally when you're eight, nine, 10 years old, you might show up or just kind of start, you know, messing around a few weeks before. Well, now you need to start taking it maybe a little bit more seriously and maybe plan something out four to six weeks in advance and you start to prepare yourself, but you go slow. It's slow increments. No, usually we say no more than about 10% a week, no more than 10 to 20% a week. And that's that workload so that you build up your fatigue level as well as your fitness level. So that by the time the season comes around, your body is already ready to handle the rigors of the season. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, and this is this is a good question. I wanted to end with this one. So okay. um, someone says, do you ever do webinars for coaches? Since besides parents um, and players, coaches need to be trained on how to train their athletes in and out of season. So that's a good question. Um, well, I would say is this, and I don't know if there's any coaches on right now. It's It's really important that I respect that I'm on the sports medicine side and the coaches or managers, they're on kind of the, the sports side. We'll provide suggestions to coaches or to managers who are in whatever sport it may be, but they're going to be the ones that are implementing strategy, implementing, are you going to you know, drop your hands? Are you going to raise your hands up? You can put your hand top of the ball, side of the ball, th things like that. And I'm very cognizant and respectful to never step on the coaches from that side, just like they are, are very good about listening to us about injuries and return to play. We are happy uh, to provide, you know, any webinars for coaches. If there's interest, I'm more than happy to work with, with you, Marsha and Erica. If there's coaches, whether it be in the, in the greater North Central Florida area, uh, in any sport, you know, uh, that pertains to throwing, whether it's baseball or softball, Javelineers, oh, there's a lot less javelineers because of track and field. Um, so I think that's helpful. The challenge also is though we can't do it between January and summertime just because they're usually coaching. So I'm happy to set that up. Uh, if anyone has interest, the person that asked that question, shoot me an email. More than happy to work with you to set something up. Okay, great. Um, quick, one last quick question because it's a fast okay. one. Uh, if I'm interested in having my child play college baseball and hopefully beyond, is there one thing I could have my child do in the summer, like training, playing, et cetera, that, that would help maybe for a, a, a kid in the nine to 13 year old range? Oh like, man. So that cross one training. Thing, uh, the one thing is do a little bit of everything. Um, you know, number one, we, we didn't go into depth about it, but I, we don't want early sports specialization in the nine to 13 year old age group, play baseball, play other sports as well. That's the time to try lacrosse, try soccer, try swimming, try cross country, try rugby, whatever. Um, so that's number one. Um, we know that playing different sports kind of develops the kind of neuromuscular kind of system so that you know, maybe you're really good at baseball and they put you on a soccer pill field and you just have no idea how to kick a soccer ball. Well, if you get good at soccer, you actually may become better with your footwork and become a better outfielder. Kind of the, one of the cool stories, um, if uh, folks remember Tim Duncan with the Spurs, 
he was a soccer player growing up. I think it was in the Caribbean, even though he was six foot 10. That's why his footwork was so good when he got to college and eventually with the Spurs. So if I was to say one thing is to encourage your son or daughter to try as many sports as possible at that younger age. And if they, when they get into high school and especially like sophomore, junior year, if they want to start to specialize in baseball or softball at that point, I think that's fine by then. Okay, good. I also wanted to, to point out to the audience that we have recorded tonight's um, seminar and we'll, I'll send that recording out. It takes me sometimes up to a week to get that sent out, but I will get that to you. And um, then if you have any questions or anything like that, Dr. Zremski shared his information and his email is in there. So I thank everyone for uh, joining us tonight and taking time out of their um, a, um busy schedule uh, as the seasons are underway and things like that. And I uh, really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Thanks everybody. And thank you again, Marsha and Erica and uh, good luck for the season and uh, feel free to shoot me emails if there's any questions. Have a good evening, everybody. Good night.